Thanks, everyone. All right, perfect. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, beyond word embeddings and some of the trends in natural language processing that we've seen, uh, kind of some where the pitfalls and where some of the constraints of the current state-of-the-art methods are, and what some of the research is and the uh, direction that the field seems to be going. So before I get started, just a little bit about myself. My name is Ari Bornstein. I'm an open source engineer at Microsoft. Um, what does that mean? It means that we work with different companies within the Israeli ecosystem. We partner with them to develop open source code, which we then share with partners around the world. Uh, in addition to that, I am a master's student here at Bar Ilan uh, under the guidance of Ido Dagan in the Natural Language Processing Lab. Um, one of the things I want to say before any conversation about natural language processing, I think it's really important for us to note that the concept of natural language processing is not new. Often when we see a lot of advances in a field, we come up with new ideas and we think that we're redefining the field. And there are a lot of advances, but it's really important to understand the history of the field before we move forward and understand the current trends. So I really like this slide because it highlights some of the key things that around uh, natural language processing in the past, from the Georgetown IBM experiments of the early days of machine translation, to ELISA and the early bots in the 1970s, and some of the other early formal grammars, and even Clippy. And you can see that while natural language processing is not new, there have definitely been some big shifts in terms of how the industry is using it and a lot of advancements. And I think it's important when we think about natural language processing to first take a step back and say, why is this important? And we saw one example with uh, Uri's last talk. Um, but one of the things to note is traditionally, when we thought of natural language processing in the industry, it's been traditionally focused on the fields of information uh, extraction and document classification and also search. And you might see it in your major search engines or Baidu, Google, Bing, and the rest. But I think recently we've been seeing a lot of other key industry trends in natural language processing that have fueled a lot of the interest and research uh, in the field. Uh, one of the big ones in terms of funding is unlocking unstructured data. So uh, now that we have these huge quantities of large big data and huge databases and a lot of it is unstructured text, how can we actually take this text and provide context to our applications and the models that we're building. How do we actually extract features from that? The other example is automation solution scale. So this is where all the, the bots that we've seen and being able to provide context and being able to scale out processes that are currently manned by individuals. Uh, and a really good example of that is the work that we just presented around uh, legal document classification and being able to extract the information from legal documents as opposed to paying a lawyer $400 an hour to do that. In the last field where we're seeing a lot of interest around the advancements of natural language processing is ambient computing. And the idea of being able to use natural language processing to better parse and understand how we interact with our environments and also interact with the sensors and the other smart connected devices around us. Uh, and what's really nice about this uh, is that whether it's Google or everyone from Microsoft to BIU, NLP, and AI2, there's, they're, they're really pioneers in the space and it's provided me really interesting insight in some of the milestones and things that are advancing in this field. Uh, I want to review some of the top uh, neural NLP milestones now and then we'll get into kind of what's driving these milestones from a technical perspective. So one of the big ones recently over the past five years is sentiment analysis, the ability to understand the sentiment of a tweet so that I can provide more con or maybe a customer support query so I can provide a more contextual response, whether it's positive, negative. Uh, addition to this, some of the, the additional research is you can take this a step further with aspect-based sentiment analysis. So for instance, if I give a sentence talking about how I love the pizza, but I hate the anchovies. Understanding that from a, instead of just a single sentiment score for that sentence, understanding that I love pizza, but I hate anchovies is contextual uh, for the, each of the aspects of sentiment analysis. We've seen a lot of advancement in those fields. Another big one is machine reading. 
comprehension? And uh, how many here of you guys, how many of you guys here know of Squad, for example? All uh, right, a couple. So the idea of being able to take a paragraph that I provide, uh, such as this paragraph about Tesla, and then be able to provide questions, such as uh, what city did Tesla move to, and then I actually am able to get a response or an answer using attention, which we've seen a lot of advancement in this field. We'll talk in a little bit why this advancement is a little bit misleading, but why it's still really, really interesting. And again, you can imagine from when we're talking about all those different industry applications earlier, how important it is to be able to take a large amount of text and be able to query it with natural language queries and get answers, it's almost science fiction, right? Uh, another big improvement or field that we've seen, uh, a lot of improvement is, is this concept of textual entailment, natural language inference. And this is a really important task in information extraction, information retrieval. Uh, the concept is that I give a premise sentence, such as, um, you know, um, John went to the store, uh, and then I give a second sentence, John was at Walmart, and I try to imply, or the first sentence will say, John was at Walmart, John went to the store, and I try to build a model that tells me whether I can, uh, whether these two sentences entail each other, whether they contradict each other, or whether they have nothing to do with each other. And again, one of the reasons that this task is so important in terms of information extraction, being able to provide contextually rich applications, is because when we do modeling, it's fairly easy for us to build high recall systems, systems that bring, uh, give us lots of potential answers. And if we have a very strong natural language inference system, we can actually then narrow down our candidate answers to the answers that actually represent the information that we want to uh, that provide the context that we need for our users. And so we've seen a lot of uh, improvement there. And another one which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with if you've been using uh, any translation software in the past five years and you've seen the development here is uh, neural machine translation. And there's been huge progress in this field. So the next thing that I want to talk about a little bit is how have we gotten here? What, what's changed over the past six, seven years that's really enabled us to see these big advances or milestones in a field that's been around for 60 years and where we really had been blocked for so long? Uh, and to do that, I think we need to take a step back. Uh, one of the things, uh, some of this stuff, some of you guys might know, some of it you guys might not know, uh, but I promise by the end of this, there'll be some new information for everyone. So. Uh, the first thing I want to define is what's the concept of a word vector? Well, for those of you who don't know, the concept is, is that a word vector allows you to map words or phrases to numbers or, or a numerical representation that a computer can process. We have individual words in a sentence or like the words that I'm telling you now. Uh, a computer, if I just feed all that information in, doesn't know what each of those words are. We have to provide it with some sort of encoding that enables the computer to understand what each word means, right? And traditionally, uh, the easiest way to do this would be with a bag of words representation. If you went back even five, six, seven years ago, this is the traditional representation everyone uses. Now, I would still argue that there's still some practical applications of this representation. I'll give an example in uh, a little bit later in the presentation. But the general idea is I have my whole vocabulary space. So for instance, if I'm talking about this uh, presentation right now, I would take every single word that I've used in this presentation and I would create a large matrix or a large vector of every single word. And then I would essentially put a, if I want to represent a given word, I put a one in the index where that word is in the vector and that means that that word is represented. And what I can then do is I can use the bag of word representation to build frequency-based probabilistic models or other models that we'll get into that can model the different frequency of bag of words, and then I can make basic predictions. And for a very long time, this was the key representation that we used, right? Uh, one of the challenges on top of this is that if we just treat every single word the same, we run into the problem that we're not uh, thinking about the context of where we got the word from. So the next step of in terms or advancement on top of how we think of bag of words is weighting each of the words. 
So instead of just putting a one in the index, maybe I'd put a score or weight in the index based on which document it occurred in and how many times it appeared in a given document. For example, if I'm building a classification system and I have a word that appears 20 times in the same document, maybe I shouldn't provide the same amount of weight to that word as, 20 docu as if that word appeared in 20 different documents. It has a very different distribution and value. Uh, so that was this concept of TFIDF. We said earlier, how many people heard of word to vec Okay, how many people think word to vec was the first distributional representation? How many people know of other distributional representations? Okay, so two. So I think what's really interesting is we like to think, uh, or there's a lot of talk or a lot of common misconception that word to vec was the first distributional representation. The first, uh, essentially, vector representation that provides meaning beyond just bag of words, and this is actually not the case. A lot of the innovations that we see from word to vector that word to vector on block that have actually been being done, were being done in academia for a period of uh, 10, 20 years. The challenge is it was very, very hard to build these models. And the way that we did this is using uh, distributional embeddings. And essentially what you would do is you use this concept that you know the meaning of a word based on the context that the word occurs. So if I have a word like apple, how do I define the word apple? I don't just look and say, okay, apple appears, and apple appears 20 times, so this is the meaning of apple. That doesn't give me any context around what the actual meaning of apple is. Instead, I look at how, what other words does apple appear with? Maybe juice, maybe oranges, maybe fruit. And when I look at the context and the relations between apple and each of the other words that it looks that it appears with, I get a better distributional understanding of what that word is. And so prior to word to vec, uh, the way that we would provide these representations is essentially you would take a large corpus and you would count how many times does a word occur with another word. You'd create this big matrix and maybe you try to reduce that using principal component analysis or SVD or some other matrix operation. And again, computationally expensive, not a perfect representation, but it is something that was being used in academia and less so and in certain labs in uh, the industry, but prior to the concept of word to vec Now things started to change with uh, neural embeddings, and I'll briefly get into this. So word to vec we talked about. Uh, how many people said they didn't know what word to vec was still? All right, so we still have a couple. This is really good. So the concept, again, is that we know the meaning of a word based on the words that appear around it, right? Uh, so that traditionally, instead of just coming up with all the frequencies, what if we could build a toy model that tries to learn that concept? So essentially, the, the general idea of word to vec and there are actually two main variations, one's called CBAO and one's called SkipGram, they do two different things, is that I take a given word, in the CBAO representation, I take uh, f essentially my, the four words that surround my given word, right? And I try to predict what the given word is. And when I train a model to do this over time, the vector representations that allow me to, uh, or the weights that allow me to predict what the missing word is, actually then turn out that they contain some of the semantic information of what the word actually means, right? And additionally, there's another variation where I do the opposite. So I take a given word and I try to predict what are the four words that are surrounding it in a given sentence. And I train this on a lot of words. And when I do that, I start learning certain things about the context that the word appears in, the meaning of the word. Now, there's a problem with this that we'll get into in a second. Words have multiple meanings. So for instance, if I talk about a, the word play, a play could be a show or you know, something that happens in the theater, or it could be the act of playing with a friend, right? It could be a verb. And when I'm learning words in this way and I'm learning these word embeddings, we have this challenge of word sense disambiguation. It's very hard to differentiate what the senses are. They're all stored in the same vector. But in the meantime, we can drop that. We'll, we'll get into some of the advances around how we, we get around that problem in a minute. But the importance is you can still disambiguate the sense, right? Because play 
the act of playing can be, I can play soccer, I can play um, you know, with some friends, but then noun, I can't use it in that same sense. So if you look at the actual context that appears, there is some disambiguation. The challenge is, is with like a neural me methods, right? It's very hard for us to define specifically, and we'll get into that when we differentiate. And that, that's, very, that's a very, very good point. Uh, while we're finishing up word vectors, so when we talk about these neural embeddings, word to vec was just the beginning of this. The, the two other main representations that are used a lot here when we talk about traditional neural uh, word embeddings is glove vectors. And the concept, the, the main difference between word to vec and glove vectors is glove vectors kind of take the same concept of what we we're doing with these previous distributional embeddings where we create these matrices and understand what the context and relations between words are. And then essentially we're using the neural network to try to reduce that matrix to get a better representation that we can use as an embedding for our given words. And the other one which came out a couple years ago, which was this concept of fast text, is in addition, instead of just looking at words, some, the challenge with just regular word embeddings is what happens if there's out of domain words that we've never seen before. In our models, we won't know how to handle that and it can affect the performance of our model. So what fa the innovation of fast text is in addition to just looking at uh, embeddings for the words, we look at embeddings at, of characters or certain prefixes and suffixes, subword sequences, and we combine that with the actual embedding for the word because if we have some understanding, for instance, a word ends with the ing, like running or jumping, then maybe it has a specific context that uh, it gives us give an information about a word that we've never seen before. So this is great and this gives us a way of now representing words uh, and language, but we still need a model and actually use this to actually train models. And uh, I wanna talk very, very quickly before we start, we talked about these advancements. Uh, the next step is understanding how did the modeling change over time? So traditionally we use different types of models like uh, Markov, hidden Markov models that helped us model sequences using uh, Markov assumption and, and, and uh, Bayesian probabilities. And we, would also, we also might use uh, specific feature engineering based on understanding uh, frequency counts of our bag of words and apply them to traditional models like logistic regression, boosted decision trees, forests, uh, and other Bayesian probabilistic methods. And these actually work pretty well. The challenge is, again, the feature engineering that goes in and understanding how do we represent each of these features. There are a lot of constraints on that. And in the beginning, what's interesting is when there was a lot of innovation around neural that we saw through CNNs and uh, feed forward networks in the field of computer vision, Originally, we didn't see much of that innovation hit natural language processing. It took gradual time before uh, we saw that. Uh, if you look at just a traditional deep learning model with a feed-forward network, it didn't make that much of an impact or a difference between a lot of the traditional methods that we were using with uh, machine learning, uh, with with logistic regression and trees and Bayesian methods. In fact, in a lot of cases, it just added a lot more compute time. But where I think there are two main innovations there that, that caused a lot of these advancements that we saw earlier, the first is the one-dimensional convolutional neural network. And the way this works is we take our representational embedding that we talked about earlier, and we have one for each word in the sentence. And essentially, then we, prov we learn essentially a transformation that we apply in a, a sequential fashion like a convolution, one, which is called the one-dimensional convolution, over the entire sequence, and this provides us, and when we stack a couple of these, we can learn filters that, learn, that serve as essentially n-gram extractors, or the ability to combine multiple words, or words that co-occur uh, from our embeddings, and then we can build stronger models from them. The other one that was really, really big was the concept of the recurrent neural network. And this is, this is where, how many of you guys have heard by this point, hopefully everyone, LSTMs and GRUs, right? It, and the big advantage of this and what this really provided, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a second, 
is it provided us to do a lot of really interesting things with text and combining text as features uh, through encoding and embedding text that was really hard for us to do prior based on the concept of the Markov assumption. So it allowed us to get around the Markov assumption, it allowed us to do things like building encoder, decoder networks, uh, so I can take a full sentence in, that's, I can encode it into one vector and then expand the sentence out in another language, which expanded a lot of the work that we're doing with neural machine translation. I could take uh, a description of an image and I could embed that, the, the description into a given vector and try it from that vector now to try to link that to an image. So then when I'm given a new image, I can, encode, I can decode that back into another description. And you see that a lot of these really cool demos that we were seeing uh, four or five years ago came out of this concept of uh, RNNs. And recently, uh, through, there's been some additional advances around what are called attention mechanisms uh, in transformer networks. But even before transformer networks, these were applied uh, with RNNs and other uh, mechanisms, and essentially, the, 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 general, the general shift between the traditional RNN and the attention mechanism is that if I have a se sequence network, right, and I take my full sentence and I go through and I just take the output and I get one vector that represents the entire sentence and now I try to predict something, I'm losing a lot of information. And so the idea of the attention network is instead to take each one output at each word in my sequential network and then to provide some sort of weighting mechanism that tells me what's the impact of that given output, each of the given outputs on my output sequence and it provides me with a lot more information so that I can do alignment. And what's really nice about that is a lot of the advancements that we see in terms of natural language processing come from this ability to align. So again, I know I'm moving a little fast because of the time constraints. I want to talk a little bit about how this all fits together, and then we'll talk about the constraints. So a good example of how this all converges to build something a little bit stronger is before we talked about the problem of word sense disambiguation. Well, one of the things that I can do is I can pre-train language models using these networks, and then I can actually use that to help me differentiate between the meaning of words. Because when I take a new sentence now, the Broadway play premiered yesterday, instead of now using an embedding for one pre-trained embedding for each of these words, I provide the pre-trained embeddings as input. I provide it through the network and I come out with these new values that actually help me different, that gives me a new value that actually helps me better differentiate which play that I have here. So if I look at this as a human and I know the Broadway play premiered yesterday, now th because I have the context of the full sentence and a new vector that encodes some of that context, I can better differentiate and know that this play is a show and not the act of play. Soccer, for example, right? And this was huge, uh, this was a, a paper that came out about a year and a half ago and this was huge because it allowed us to take a lot of traditional tasks that we were blocked on and moves anywhere between three to five percentage points in terms of overall F1 score and uh, across the board tasks. And from here, there's been a lot of advancements in terms of how do we take these contextual embeddings and improve them using uh, attention and transformer networks and a couple other tricks around masking. I won't get too deep in it now, if you're curious about it, I wrote some blog posts, and we can talk about it after. So everything's solved, and now we know how to la model language, and we can move on, right? Well, unfortunately, I wish that was the case. Actually, kind of not, because then my masters wouldn't be very useful. But the truth is, while we've made huge strides and huge advancements in natural language processing, natural language processing is hard. And this is something I stole from Yoav Goldberg. Um, Language is ambiguous. So I thought I'd get a few more laughs, but I guess most people have seen it already. Um, but language is ambiguous, and there are a couple of pitfalls to a lot of these standard neural models that we're seeing in terms of natural language processing. So one of the big ones that we see is, even though we're getting these great results on the data that we're training on, 
uh, we see a lot of superficial correlation. So actually, our results might not be as good as we think we are. So for instance, there's a, a classical uh, tutorial on how I accidentally made a racist AI without even trying. And you see here that they trained a bunch of different word models based on a lot of text. Uh, and then they tried out a couple sentiments on things that should be the same. So for instance, my name is Emily, my name is Heather, my name is Yvette, my name is Shaniqua. And they saw that progressively, the sentiment score gets worse, even though it should be the same. Now, the challenge is, you know, we trained this model on all this given data, and there's some implicit bias within the data that we're training on, right? And what we're seeing is we're learning a correlation based on this implicit bias in our given task, even though that bias isn't actually related to the given task that we're trying to learn, right? So this is what I call a superficial correlation. And uh, another example, classical sentiment example of this would be, let's go get Italian food, let's go get Chinese food, which give different sentiment analysis already, and then let's go get Mexican food, and all of a sudden the sentiment drops, uh, even though, again, these should be more or less equal. And we see this not just in sentiment analysis models, but we also see this in uh, tr uh, translation models. I'll give you an example from uh, Google Translate, where if we have small amounts of data, I can type a bunch of random values like gibberish, and it will actually translate it to words that it thinks are meaningful, right? And another example of this is in question answering systems, where I ask questions like how many, and I get an answer like two because when it looks at the data, two is correlated to probably the best default answer, but it should probably actually give me an answer like how many what. And this is my favorite one is when it says, is there or are there, and the answer comes yes, this is how you know that the model was trained in the United States and not in Israel, because if it was in Israel, it would default to no. So in addition to super uh, official correlations, and I, actually this is a byproduct of that in my opinion, is that models can fail under adversarial evaluation. If we know that the, this question, amazing question and answering model that we created before is just doing an alignment and taking, attention, taking a large amount of data, learning how to attend to specific patterns that are correlated in the data, and we, learn, and we have an idea of why they're doing that, then I can, but we know that it's not actually doesn't actually know what the real answer is, it just knows how to attend to what it thinks is the real answer is, then I can provide an adversarial example that's structured like how the real answer is, and I can actually manipulate the model. So you can see the exact same uh, question about an uh, example around Tesla earlier. If I take this sentence that talks about a whole other person moving to Chicago, but structurally the sentence aligns better with the how the model attends, all of a sudden, the answer comes out Chicago when it should still be Prague. And you can imagine if I'm running a legalese document and people all of a sudden are figuring out that they can construct specific turns of phrases to manipulate that legal document, that would be very, very bad. So it's something that you have to be aware of with, with a lot of these models and a lot of the constraints around deep learning. Another big challenge that we're seeing is, and, and, and this is another option, another big factor of this, is that a lot of these neural models are not robust to changes in semantic structure. Now, who here knows what semantic structure is? Okay, so we have two NLP guys. Who here doesn't know what semantic structure is? Amazing. All right, so the idea is, in language, there are many ways that we can say the same concept, right? And when we talk about that concept, that concept is the meaning, the semantic meaning of the sentence, right? I can ta say something in a passive way, in an active way, in a perfect way, many, many different ways, but the actual meaning of the sentence is the same. In the same way, we can train models, and because they see a lot of examples based on a specific structure of the sentence, they might not be robust if I, take the, uh, if I manipulate the structure of that sentence and say something slightly differently, I might actually get a different result, which means that the model is not actually learning what we want it to learn. So here's a perfect example. This is uh, a former, from about two year, a year and a half ago, state-of-the-art model for uh, sentiment analysis. 
and I put in a sentence, there is no pleasure in watching a child suffer. Well, there's no pleasure, suffer, so it's probably a neg negative, right? But if I change the syntactic representation, the, the, the way that we represent this sentence, without actually modifying the meaning of the sentence and watching the child suffer, there's no pleasure, all of a sudden my neural model gives me a positive score. That's strange, the meaning of these two sentences is the same, so I would expect the same value of them, right? So this is one of the big struggles that we're still dealing with, with a lot of the, even with, even BERT or OpenGM, OpenGPT2, these famous models that Elon Musk doesn't want you to see, even those models cannot sit, stop this, right? And the last big example, the big thing that I think is holding back our struggle that we're seeing in the field is this concept of lexical inference. So we talked about textual entailment and the importance of uh, textual entailment in terms of uh, information extraction uh, and information retrieval. Uh, and if I give you this example here with Jack and Jill climbed Everest and two hikers were on a mountain, do those entail each other? What would you guys say? Jack and Jill climbed Everest, there are two hikers on a mountain. Yes, hikers, people hiking. There is no correlation. Hiking is okay. I would argue that there is, right? Because Jack and Jill are on a mountain, they're, they're on Everest, they're climbing Everest, but if they're climbing Everest, there are probably parts of Everest where you can infer or imply that they're hiking Everest as well, right? Even if you argue that climbing is not the same thing as hiking, there are also times where climbing is the same thing as hiking. If you climb a mountain, you hike a mountain. It could be very, very similar. I would argue that they do entail. This is also another struggle when you're training on a lot of these data sets, is you have to look that there's also different consensus of opinion of whether things entail or not, right? But my argument is that these models struggle, and there, there are other examples as well, but these models would struggle to understand that Jack and Jill aligns with the concept of two hikers, right? Who are climbing a mountain, that hiking and climbing might be, you would expect it to think that if you looked at the, and here's where it's even more interesting, you would expect it to think if you looked at the similarity domain between the word hiking and climbing, I promise you if you look at the embedding space for hiking and climbing, they appear pretty, damn, pretty close in the same embedding space, you would expect the model to align there and say that it entails, but it's still, there's no guarantee that it will do that. And you would hope that Everest and Mountain would be pretty close, but again, uh, these models, there's, even though there are times where they do provide that type of insight, there are many times they fail to. And so that's one of the big struggles is trying to imply or infer information that's not necessarily in your data set that is real world information uh, that you might have had if you had better structure or a better way of encapsulating that context that a lot of the neural systems based on, even with contextual embeddings, fail to do that. So there's a big debate in this field uh, of how we move forward. And the debate centers around is structure or adding more structure to our models, uh, necessary good or evil, right? And there are two sides of this debate. Uh, one side is uh, on the le left here, Jan LeCun, who came from the world of computer vision and a period where everyone was making these custom filters and feels that even though structure is necessary, that it's better to do with away with structure because structure provides the implicit biases of the people who are modeling the structure. And on the other side, you have Christopher Manning, who's uh, one of the pioneers of natural language processing um, in the field of natural language processing. And he feels that the more structure that we have, the better we can model things with less data, right? And I, when it, when it, so when it comes to this question of whether is structure a necessary good or evil, I think the important thing to note is that structure is necessary. And I wanna introduce very, very quickly, because I know I'm running on time, uh, the concept of semantic structure and how we can use semantic structure to try to move forward on a lot of the problems that we saw previously. 
So one of the things we mentioned is that language is ambiguous, right? Fruit flies like banana. So there are actually two potential meanings for this sentence, right? Fruit could fly, like the act of flying, just like a banana flies. So if I throw fruit, it could fly just like a banana flies. Or it could be fruit flies, as vuvim, the, the actual flies, like bananas, right? So traditionally, the, since the time of Panini in like the fourth century BCE, the way that we've tried to differentiate is using the concept of uh, syntactic structure. And so provide, understanding that there are certain patterns in language that we can use and we can define these patterns through grammars and we can actually differentiate between different ambiguous cases of the language. So here, because I know that like is a verb, in this case, I know that uh, fruit fly, uh, that, and that flies is probably a noun. And from this, I can actually infer that we're talking about this vuvim and we're not talking about, if flies was the verb, we'd be talking about the action of fruit flying like a banana. And so this allows us to help disambiguate sentences. And we can use these structures to build dependent, syntactic dependency structures that allow us to say, okay, there's this concept of like, and we have flies and banana. And we have a predicate like, which is our verb. We have flies, which are the insect flies. And we have a banana that they like. And so there's a relation between, a, a like relation between flies and banana. And this enables us to parse speech. Now, the challenge with these types of uh, structures is that we said that there are multiple different ways that we can express the same semantic concept with different syntactic structures. So it's very, very hard for us to, to do this, to, to use these structures practically in production and OP applications. I'm gonna move on, I'm almost finished, okay, perfect. So, um, one of the things that we would hope to do is use the methods, neural methods, to instead of creating these end-to-end -end systems, like we saw using huge language models like BERT and creating these end-to-end -end systems, we'd rather use them to create systems that better model semantic structure, and then by using that understanding or the better representation of semantic structure, we can then move from that semantic structure to actually having a model that we can use to solve our original problems without dealing with a lot of the ambiguity that we deal with before. So I'm gonna introduce three of these. I'm gonna move pretty fast. I have a blog post series on it too if you're interested. The first one is semantic role labeling, which uh, aims to recover the predicate argument structure of a sentence. So the idea is the who did what to whom, where, why, and how. I give a sentence, I have the predicate, I try to understand from that predicate what the, these relations are, no matter whether the sentence is active or passive. And you can think of a predicate as like a function in programming or a method, and the arguments as the semantic, or the semantic rules as class type arguments. So if I have a predicate bot, Mr. Morden and, and its arguments are Mr. Morden flowers pearl, and then based on knowing what that function bot does and what the order of the arguments are, then I can now use that to understand how to integrate that in my own application, right? Another representation is called uh, AMR, abstract meaning representation, and the concept of this is to build a graph that no matter what, how many different syntactic ways I give uh, a given expression, it all maps to the same semantic structure. So the idea here of the soldier was not afraid of dying, the soldier was not afraid to die, the soldier did not fear death, all maps to the same structure here. The trade-off, and, and there's actually a nice parser for this called the JAMR parser. It's still a field that's developing, so it's not a perfect language to parse. The trade-off here with AMR versus something like SRL, and the next thing that we're gonna get into is that you lose the actual sentence structure. So you learn all these relations, but you, learn, you lose their actual context in the original sentence, and that can be very, very problematic for many, uh, many types of uh, applications. 
So the next, error, the next representation that I think has a lot of potential is this concept of semantic dependency parsing. And essentially what this does is we talked earlier about semantic role labeling, which gives you this predicate argument structure, while your arguments also potentially have other arguments. So SDP provides uh, better semantic generalizations that actually map to the full structure of your full sentences. And there are a couple of different representations like universal dependencies, DM, PAS, PSD. Um, I was, one of the things I want to briefly talk about is based on my role, all right, five minutes and now I'm done, I promise. Uh, based on my role at Microsoft as an open source engineer, one of the things I try to do is take some of these concepts and make them more accessible and also take a lot of these, the academic tooling that often just works on a given researcher's machine and is hard to reproduce, though to be fair, that's been improving, but to try to make that more accessible to the average developer. So one of the things that I did here in a previous project is I took one of the uh, state-of-the-art uh, semantic dependency parser tools uh, that was written in Dynet, very, very hard to get up and running, and I worked and containerized it in such a way that you can integrate and wrote a Python wrapper so you can easily integrate it into your own applications. So this is the type of stuff that I do. I'll provide a link to it afterwards if you're interested. Uh, additionally, uh, there are a lot of different toolkits and tools coming out. Uh, things like Spacey and Flare, many of these that you guys probably know. Other ones that you guys m might know less like NLP Architect that provides some really interesting tools for multi-document co-reference. Uh, and one of the things that I've been working to do is provide essentially hello world examples that are all in one notebook of how you can get started with each of these frameworks and my own personal insights about which, because there's a lot of overlap between these different frameworks, what they work better on for different use cases. Um, and yeah, uh, with that, I'm gonna potentially open up to questions. And if you're interested in learning more about these subjects, I have a couple of blog posts here. Perfect, thanks guys.